check, 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 check. Check, 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 one, two, three, check, check, one, two, three, check, one, two, three, doesn't sound very loud. Check, check. Check, check. Check, check. Can you hear that? I, it doesn't no. sound. Check, check. One, two. Check, check. Check. Anyone hear me? Check. Check, check, one, two. Okay. Okay, cheap checking, checking, checking. That's probably a little too loud. <laughs> no, that's okay? <laughs> well, that's because everyone's talking. Okay. This is sound check by crowdsource. So that's why you can't do a sound check when you got a room full of people. You know what, Tom? I'll do the speaker. When we come back up, then you'll be quiet. This is, they're all. Check yeah. one, two. You're going to have to bring this, the stem, bring the stem up. This is, you got to bring the stem up. Or there, that works. That's good. But this is going to drop, so it's got to be up high, unless you're going to tape it up here. Right here. Not, not too high, right there. No, you see, it's, well, it's drooping, but we'll see. It is too high. It, it's, it, should be, it should be right on my, more on my chin. Check one, two. All right, are you going to do a check or are we just, yeah. okay. I'm just waiting for you guys to just uh, okay. get uh, volume. <laughs> Check, 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 check. Check, 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 check. Mm. 
Check one, two. One, two, three, check, check. Check, check, one, two. Test, one, two, three, check. Check. Are you happy with that? Fifteen minutes late, but we have fifteen minutes because we're not switching ropes, right? Okay. So... <laughs> All right, we just start. You guys are the second half. Yeah. Now are you gonna intro, get it going. Yes. Okay. No, I. Right. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. Testing. Can you hear me? Is this working? It's not working. Can this work? If you can hear me, look over here. <laughs> we're getting started. We're starting 15 minutes late, but we've gained 15 minutes because we're not going to have to move indoors from outdoors. So it's all good. We're ready to go. We're going to start with, with one song and then a little bit of talking and then the, the musical show and, and then a lot more talking. Uh, Tom Nielsen and Lynn Waldron uh, are some of the best musicians our movement could have. Uh, we'll give them a, a, a real introduction later, but let's, let's have one song to, to open this up. Thanks, y'all, for being here. I'm gonna lay down my sword and shield down by the riverside, down by the riverside, down by the riverside. I'm gonna lay down my sword and shield down by the riverside and sturdy study war no more, ain't gonna study war no more, ain't gonna study war no more, I ain't gonna study war no more, ain't gonna study war no more, ain't gonna study war no more, I'm gonna lay down that war machine, I'm by the riverside, I'm by the riverside, I'm by the riverside, I'm gonna lay down that war machine, I'm by the riverside and study war no more. I ain't gonna study war no more, I ain't gonna study war no more, I ain't gonna study war no more. I ain't gonna study war no more, I ain't gonna study war no more, I ain't gonna study war no more. I'm gonna lay down that space force, I'm by the riverside, I'm by the riverside, I'm by the riverside, I'm gonna lay down that space force, I'm by the riverside and study war no more. I ain't gonna study war no more, I ain't gonna study war no more, I ain't gonna study war no more. I ain't gonna study war no more, I ain't gonna study war no more, I ain't gonna study war no more. I'm gonna lay down those drone attacks down by the riverside, down by the riverside. I'm by the riverside, gonna lay down those ground attacks. I'm by the riverside and study war no more. I ain't gonna 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 study war no more. I 
Lovely. Indeed, study war no more. Um, it is my now my pleasure to introduce uh, Yenho Dunquis, Bonnie Jane Maracal, Maracal, who will be talking to us a few bit of words about the land that we're standing on today. So, Sego Zewa Guego, Yenho Dunquis, Yungets, Wagata Huni. My real name is Yen Ho Dungwis. My English name is Bonnie Jane Miracle. I'm from the Wolf Clan of the Mohawk Nation. And um, I um, work here in Toronto at the University of Toronto in First Nations House. But I'm also a member of, uh, uh, in the Mohawk Nation, I'm a, a member of the Haudenosaunee traditional community. And I wanted to welcome people here from globally, the global community here onto the, the lands that traditionally were the lands of my ancestors. Um, being Mohawk people, part of the Iroquois Confederacy, the Six Nations people that long used this land um, and lived on this land for centuries and centuries and centuries prior to the settlers coming to the shores of Turtle Island. Um, in this area, especially between the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee, um, there was a peace pact of care how to take care of this land um, um, reflected in our treaty that um, dish with one spoon, which is um, that we will all lend and be respect, respect and be thankful for what we, we use on this earth. One of the things for the indigenous peoples of North America, Turtle Island, is the fact that everything here was given to us for, by the creator. And we are caretakers of that. And we are to use and be thankful for what we use because we need to have something left for the next generation and our grandchildren, seven generations from that. So we're always, we're mindful of that. Here too lived the um, Wyandot, um, the um, Seneca, which is part of the Six Nations. But also to that idea that the last of, I guess, the stronghold of, of being here on this territory were the Mississaugas, who too were eventually um, marginalized and moved out of the area. But still, um, this land is the responsibility of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe still to this day because our treaty is still intact. But also, too, we, this was a trade center for thousands and thousands of years and has still remained so even now globally um, with peoples of the diverse nations of people coming here to act accordingly. However, to be mindful that that treaty still holds true for all of us to be respectful and thoughtful and thankful. Also part of the um, Haudenosaunee teachings um, 
within the longhouse, our teachings tell us that when the human beings were created from the beginning of time, that we all, as a human being, too, we were given a set of directions as to what we were to do here on Earth. And because we were created last of everything that exists here, then we were the caretakers. And each the colors of man were placed in different parts of the earth to be caretakers of that space. But the Haudenosaunee also too believe that, um, that we had original instructions, which was from the creator that for everything that was here, we take what we needed, we didn't waste, and we were always give our greetings and thanksgivings to all those entities of creation that were doing what they were doing to sustain the life of the human being. So um, today, the Haudenosaunee still honor that. So um, those thanksgivings to all those entities of creation. So whenever there is opportunity to do so, especially in this day and age, that um, we still give our greetings and thanksgivings to those entities of creation and um, forever be thankful for they're really, really struggling now to sustain us as human beings. Take, for example, the water, the trees, all of those, their functions are for the people. So as we, um, so that all, all human beings were given, given those instructions. We are caretakers and be thankful. So the Haudenosaunee still do that. So we take the opportunity whenever people are gathered so to acknowledge those um, entities of creation, kind of like a pat on the back for them to keep up the good work because they are really keeping us alive. The, um, and this is called the Ohandagari Wadakwa, and it just simply translates to being the words before all else. And some, some you'll hear it as an opening address, an opening thanksgiving, but it's, we never refer to it as a prayer because we're not asking for anything. Ours is to be thankful and honor that. So on behalf of everyone here, I want to offer to those entities of creation who also too, when they hear the original words of the human being, their ears pick up and they bring their attentions to the matter that's being done. And this here to me is a very important matter to maintain peace and work towards peace. And we need all the energies that we can gather of all those entities of creation to lend their energies to us globally to help do that. So this is kind of on your behalf, I would like to be able to give that greetings and thanksgiving. So basically I'm just saying we give our greetings and thanksgivings to all these different entities from the, the, the ground up to into the, the skies and to the, the creator. Okay. Gunjokwa say wada hun si uskat nigari wesa. Ne gari dat si the one no rada ne sungwai di zon. Ne wahi rosa on you. Magwe gojina hoda de yo de wari e netju hujadi. De tino rada ne ungwe sung a. De tino rada ne yeti nista o hunja. De tino rada ne o nega sung a. De tina radane gunjon sung a. De tina radane o hunde sung a. De tina radane o dera sung a. De tina radane o nunqua sung a. De tina radane gakwa sung a. De tina radane gahi sung a. De tina radane o genoa sung a. De tina radane garanda sung a dana ogwer sung a. De tina radane gundirio. De tina radane o jidan o gunga. De tina radane gayeri nigawarage. De tina radane yeti soto gunga ruddy weras. De tsidawa nuwaradane sungwat jia anje ganeka garakwa. De tina radane yeti sutta asataneka garakwa. De tina radane o jistokwa sunga. De tsidawa nuwaradane sungwaya disa. Ona took me or we got to rewa gweni to nuanagi. Thank you very much. So with that, also to know that those entities of creation then lend their energies to 
um, your business that is at hand and hopefully you have good meetings and productive meetings, respectful meetings, and um, I wish you well. Thank you and safe travels. Thank you so much, Yenho Dunquist. Um, my name is Leah Bulger. I am the chair of the coordinating committee of World Beyond War, and I am so excited to welcome you to our third annual conference. And we are thrilled to be, for the first time, in a country that is not the United States. Uh, <laughs> Um, from the beginning, when World Beyond War was founded in uh, almost five years ago, it'll be five years in January, the idea was to create a, a network of international participation because we know it's going to take all of the world's people to end the madness of war. And so we are trying uh, as best we can to keep moving out, out, out and find more people and, and form together uh, a a network of people who are trying to and understand that it actually can be done, we can't end war. So since our humble beginning in 19, uh, 2014, uh, we now have over 75,000 signatures on our Declaration of Peace. Over 500 organizations have signed to our Declaration of Peace. And this is the part that I just uh, thrills me every time, is that those people and those organizations are from 173 countries. Isn't that great? That's great. And when you think about the potential that that, that represents, the, the power that's in having people in 173 countries who all believe that war can be ended, it boggles my mind, but I, I think we couldn't do this kind of networking and building 10 years ago, but now we can, now we can expand. So we are moving, we are trying to create new chapters outside of the United States and really focusing on that. So uh, thank you. Do we have anybody here from another country besides Canada or United States? Yay, yay. Wait, where are you from, New Zealand, I know. New Zealand. Yay. <laughs> what else? Cameroon, thank you. Yes, welcome, Cameroon. What else? Palestine. Palestine, yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Yes, sir. Rwanda. Rwanda. <laughs> this is wonderful. Thank you so much for, for, for making the time to be here to work with us. So, does anybody know what's special about today? Today is the International Day of Peace, and I, I, it's just uh, kismet that that happened the same time as our, as our, uh, our conference. So that is a wonderful thing. Um, I have to say a few thank yous. First of all, thank you so much to Dr. Peter Jones, and he's going to be saying a few words in a moment. He is the person that is our interlocutor with the OCAD University and found the space and made, that, made it happen, the logistics happen, and, and that we couldn't have done this without, without you and your support. And the support and work of the three uh, very overworked, underpaid staff members of World Beyond War, our director, David Swanson. Yeah. I don't know where he went. He's probably working somewhere. <laughs> Um, our education director, Tony Martin, a uh, Tony Jenkins, who is right there in the front. I have a mental block. I call him Tony Martin. I don't know. I don't know who Tony Martin is, but I say that all the time. And Greta Zaro, our new organizing director, who I think you've probably met or talked to. She is a whirling dervish of organizing. There's David. Yeah. All right, so without further ado, um, Peter, would you like to come up? Peter is a, a faculty member here in the College of Design of uh, Oakhead University. Thank you so much. Thank you, Leah. Hi. Thank you. So uh, I'm Peter Jones, a professor in the, the graduate programs uh, here at Oakhead University. It's my great pleasure to, um, as a member of the Faculty of Design at, at this university to welcome everybody to uh, to the auditorium. We didn't believe we didn't think we were going to get the auditorium. There was a class scheduled here until 6:45, and we had planned to have everybody 
out in, Butter in Butterfield Park. So with the kind of vagaries of the weather, we had set up all the chairs, if you might have seen. We had 150 chairs. We were ready to receive everybody under the tabletop, whether rain or shine. But it looked like rain and shine, heat and wind. And, and then the professor who had the class here, something came up with her, her personal computer. She sent the students off just as we were trying to figure out what to do. So, some, so being, this, is, this is the thing about being a creative professor is you, you kind of take it, you, you notice what's happening, you take advantage of the opportunity to make a creative event possible. So I'm, I'm uh, happy to invite you to, um, to, to participate with us this weekend at Canada's largest um, art and design school and oldest. Over for over 150 years, so um, I'm a so as a professor here, I teach in in two unique graduate programs. One's called Strategic Foresight and Innovation. It's a Master of Design program in Futures Thinking. I teach uh, a Systems Thinking course called Systemic Design, and we as well as research methods, things like that. Also, a Design for Health program. And these are kind of programs of the future. I hope some of my some of my students will be here, I know, tomorrow and maybe even today. So we'll, uh, we've certainly invited everybody, but don't be surprised if you don't, you know, they may come and go. This is uh, the weekend, and I'm afraid we may work them too hard. So I've had the honor for the last 10 years of, of these programs of, 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 uh, of teaching in these, in these new types of, of, of graduate design programs that are training a new type of designer to, to design uh, be better futures. So we actually train a type of futures thinking and strategic foresight. This is one of the few futures schools uh, in North America, and we use a design approach for that. Um, uh, I'm going to, to say just a few more words, but I wanted to say um, um, on behalf of my dean, Dr. Dor Dory Tunstall, she was scheduled to speak today, and I have to deliver uh, her regrets on, on her behalf. She became unwell today and wasn't able to, to speak with you. So I will try to be as inspired. She's an inspiring speaker. I gave her many more minutes than one when we set it up. So, um, uh, so I, I can't really speak for her message, but I will um, tell you some of my, a little bit of my story and why I'm here. So, um, so I'm, I'm really thrilled that OCAD can host um, this year, the World Beyond War, um, uh, conference, the No War 2018 conference. Um, uh, I, I'm an American citizen from Ohio and I arrived in Canada over a decade ago um, in protest of the Bush Wars. So I'm one of those that, that said, yeah. do you have friends that said this? If Bush takes in a second election or if Bush does this, I'm going to Canada? We did. We did. So. Um, and it was actually in protest of the Bush Wars, but also the events in Ohio where there was a notable election fraud. It was an election, um, election reform activist to form several citizens groups that um, did everything from collected the, the actual ballots in 66 of Ohio's 88 counties. We saved those ballots when they, the physical ballots were destroyed. We, we uh, you know, as an uh, election observer, we had everything dead to rights. We actually intervened in the... Um, the, the, the black, the uh, court case against, the federal district court case against Secretary Blackwell, which ran out the statute of limitations. So I was doing that and came, came up here at the same time. I'm just grateful, you know, the Canada has, has been a wonderful place um, for, you know, for the educational programs and for, for, for this. But I'd have to, to say while things were happening in the U.S. and in the mid-2000s, I found Canada to be a rather welcoming and peaceful culture. Um, however, what I, I didn't really understand Canadian politics, and I just one of the things I, I, I need to say is that it, it isn't really as different as you think, or at least, I mean, so this is a global situation that we're facing that we're dealing with in world beyond war. So it's not, you know, even though I, I you know, came up here for those reasons, soon after moving up here, I found that the kind of American aggression was becoming global, that the, the era of Stephen Harper, an almost decade of, of um, the Stephen Harper era, was moving kind of Canadians complacently into, into a world that was actually quite noticeable to me as being pretty consistent with the policies of the U.S. And it was hard to see that, you know, this kind of gradual, you know, moving into, into that direction. 
And, and I'd have to say even Trudeau has continued um, both the neoliberal and, and neoconservative um, policies, and it's easy to lose hope. Um, so Canada has fallen in line with U.S. policy, foreign policy direction, regardless of like the trade debacles between the countries and everything. There is still actually quite a bit of compatibility, very little difference between the foreign policy of Trudeau's um, Minister of of uh, Foreign Relations, Sec uh, Minister Freeland, and Secretary of State Pompeo. There are some notable differences with respect to Iran, for example, but, um, but Canada is perhaps um, even more gung-ho about NATO and about maintaining support for, for, you know, for NATO and so-called humanitarian interventions. So, I mean, even in the U.S. So I think, you know, there are different players at play here that that are concerning to me in, in my story. So this is so Canada is perhaps less enthused about the, the Iran mission, which is which is good. The U.S. Um, aggression toward Iran, but has been a steadfast supporter of um, uh, Israel's um, uh, program against um, the, uh, the Palestinians, and and has said very little in defense of Palestinian rights and in the recent aggression in the last few years. And so yes, that's a disappointment, but. You know, it's more than a, dem it's not just a democratic issue. This is, you know, there, there are many different ways we need to address it. So I brought, um, so I'd say, I realize there's really nowhere to run, you know, and, and that I, I, and to avoid the constantly aggravating 21st century kind of NATO or American style of, of kind of hybrid, um, multifaceted, multi, um, multi integrated war, if you'd say. So clearly I found the old, uh, you know, the old peace movement that I grew up with, you know, as, as a young person, I've actually been part of that since since Vietnam as a kid, um, isn't going to this, appro the approaches that we learned aren't going to make a big difference against the the hybrid and proxy wars that are kind of the, the constant low intensity uh, wars that we're finding now in the org oligarchic big money foreign policy. So as a designer, I also realized that we weren't being creative enough to make a difference against um, the asymmetric power um, that that we're also facing, that we don't even know, and we can't get to where the po power lies. It isn't a matter of, of of only of democratic engagement that against global wealth and the war uniparties here and in the U.S. Um, in Western governments. So as this realization dawned on me, I realized. You know, there are other things we could do. I started meeting with activists and students, and we, we have regular dialogues here. We call we have monthly dialogue programs with activists and creative dialogue called Design with Dialogue. And last year, we created a, um, a, a citizen's uh, policy brief for a Canadian people's foreign policy. And it's the start of, you know, something we'd like to take forward. I'm not a good lobbyist, so I'd like to talk with you about ideas for taking this forward. I'd have to say, though, that even with the things that we've done, I mean, it's just a start. And when I discovered World Beyond War a few years ago, I volunteered to to be a um, you know to to be a chapter chair here. And when the opportunity came to, um, to you know to host you know for for OCAD to host uh, this conference, I jumped on that. So um, I'd have to say, just in closing, um, OCAD's recognition. I want to recognize OCAD as uh, OCAD University, the Ontario College of Art and Design University, as a creative force for social and, and systems change. And I think we have the opportunity to take a more creative participatory approach to radically rethinking how we engage with peace and an anti-war and, and what I call the business of war, which is what our workshop is on tomorrow, and to, and to rethink how, how we create interventions. I have to say, I'm, as part of that, I'm very impressed uh, with the work that World Beyond War has done in the, in the global security system. This is the kind of work that I see as it's an impressive book, and you're all going to read it. I know, and, I'm, I, I, and now that I've been working with it, I actually hope to expose my, my students to it, because this is consistent with the new ways of thinking of, of, of uh, working with the system in a holistic way and intervening in those systems in creative ways and, and using all the different disciplines that we can bring together on this. So my vision is to protect people living in all civilizations from the constant threat of the modern, of modern approach to violence that benefits wealthy investors and degrades the potential of the new human-centered social economies that we are envisioning and that we are, we are trying to build. So thank you for being here and I look forward to meeting everybody.
Thank you so much, Peter. Um, Peter mentioned our, our structure of chapters and affiliates, and that is really essential to what we're doing, is, is building from the ground up all over the world. So now we're going to have three reports, uh, two from people who are country coordinators in their countries, and one who is a chapter leader, to tell you a little bit about their work and in, in, uh, what they're doing. So um, let's do uh, Joe, uh, SRTA from uh, Japan. Thank you. Um, yes, my name is Joseph Essertier, and I uh, am a World Beyond War activist organizer in Japan. And um, let's see, I'm not very good at uh, speaking off the cuff, so I'm, I actually wrote down what I wanted to say today. Thanks. Um, so. I th there's, I'm quoting the words of a Japanese man who experienced the Second World War. He said that nothing is more barbar barbarous than war. Nothing is more cruel. Um, and one of the questions I think we are asking people is, why don't we start then by ending the entire institution of war? Banning the use of weapons of mass destruction is a good start. But in the long run, uh, I think we do have to, to ban war itself if we human beings are to start walking towards some kind of decent future. So yes, let's get people together and take action to kick the habit. Uh, just like smoking, you know, war is a dirty, ugly habit. Uh, and um, yes, so uh, as a Japanese uh, survivor of sexual slavery in Manchuria said, no matter how long it takes, one must keep talking. It sounds really simple. Uh, but I think her, it's true. Um, that's kind of the, uh, the point. Uh, so there have been non-warring societies in human si history who managed to keep on talking and who did not throw up their hands in frustration and attack the other tribe or the other nation in, en masse. So why not liberate all human society from the scourge of war? What is there to lose by trying, even by experimenting? Um, so that's what I'm thinking uh, as I as I join uh, World Beyond War in this project. Um, now, as far as what am I what I'm doing? Um, I live in Japan, and as you know, hundreds of thousands of human beings in Japan were the victims of surely the most savage, morally indefensible attack on civilians in human history. Uh, that is the atomic bombing of Nagasaki. Uh, this crime was committed three days after, after the atrocity in Hiroshima. So we can say that Harry Truman knew exactly what he was doing in Nagasaki when he dropped those bombs. Uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki are just two examples of the tremendous suffering that Japanese endured during the 1930s and the first half of the 1940s for the sake of the total war in China and the Pacific, Pacific War. Uh, so there's no surprise that Japanese people continue to be pro-peace. Uh, on the whole, unlike elderly Americans, there are uh, many elderly Japanese who remember and feel the scars of war even today. But the anti-war movement is weak in Japan. The ultra-right is well-funded and dominates the media. Teachers have not taught their students their country's history, just as teachers in the U.S. have not, their, not taught our students theirs. The Japanese government has colluded with the U.S. Uh, I'm an American citizen, and I've been in Japan for about 25 years. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, the government, U.S. government uh, has, and the Japanese government have cooperated to cover up and brush, uh, brush under the carpet the history of the suffering in Japan, the suffering caused by the Second Sino-Japanese War and the Pacific War. Naturally, few Japanese youth show concern about war, not at least to the extent that they, and not at least to the extent that they actively oppose it. Uh, so, what is the world beyond? Well, so, what are we doing in Japan? Well, our first educational event will be on November 10th, remembering the 100th anniversary of Armistice Day. Um, I have invited the renowned photojournalist Kenji Higuchi to Nagoya to speak about the history of poison gas as a weapon, and I've 
rented one of the larger halls in Nagoya for that. Uh, it, can seat, it can seat 300 people. I don't know if we're going to get that many, but <laughs> uh, I rented it. And um, he's going to uh, exhibit his photos. Uh, in terms of demos, we, meaning uh, uh, not just World Beyond War, but other um, groups in Nagoya that I'm working with, um, are uh, working uh, for peace on the Korean Peninsula. And um, we've had four demos for that. Um, we've used candlelights, just like the uh, South Koreans have used in their candlelight revolution. How many of you have heard about the, you've read something, or you've, you know a little bit about the candlelight revolution? Okay, yeah, many people haven't heard about it yet. So um, I just wrote a, uh, about a, a, an interview about, I interviewed a South Korean candlelight revolution activist. And, uh, but, um, so let's see, what else? Um, and uh, yeah, our demo was featured in uh, the Mainichi newspaper, one of Japan's largest papers. And I was interviewed on June 12th on local television in, in Nagoya. And a short clip of my comments was um, broadcast um, on the, the Trump-Kim summit. Uh, then um, last week we had a lecture by Wada Haruki, who's one of, he's probably the most uh, uh, prominent uh, Japanese historians of uh, Korea and also um, uh, Russia, and uh, so um, and he's worked on it for peace in Korea for many decades. Um, but we had about 50 to 100 participants at each of these demos, and I've participated in approximately, uh, probably about one third of the 100. We've had 100 weekly demos against the bases in in Okinawa. How many of you know that, that the United States is building two new bases in Okinawa? Yeah, Ten, uh, Heno, Henoko and Takai are the name of the bases. And they just started pouring the um, uh, sand into the, to destroy the, one of the healthiest corals, coral reefs, uh, which is um, necessary for the uh, dugong, uh, uh, the habitat for the dugong. This is the, uh, this is one of the um, uh, signs that we use. <clears throat> so, and this says, it says, uh, protect, protect the ocean for the dugong, the dugong. And this says that we are against the, uh, we are opposed to the uh, Henoko and uh, the new uh, bases in Okinawa. So, the, yeah, the U.S. continues to expand in Okinawa, and um, uh, they only, it's a very small population, very small percentage of the population, but they have 70% of U.S. military bases. Um, so we, there's discrimination against Okinawans, there's discrimination against Koreans, and we're, we are uh, opposing, we, see, we, we definitely are connecting uh, the discrimination to the um, the way that the U.S. is able to exploit them. Uh, I probably have over my five minutes. <laughs> uh, so, but let's see. Um, so we've had 100 demos. We have demos every week um, against the uh, new base construction in Okinawa. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Also, I've given I give two short speeches about um, the history of the military sex slave system of the Empire of Japan. How many of you have heard of the comfort, so-called comfort women? Okay, that's, that's, that's good. Thank you. I'm learning one of the reasons I came here is I wanted to find out what was going on over here with the peace movement. Um, and uh, so we, yeah, we had a, an event with about 150, not World Beyond War, but another organization. I was invited to 150 people in the audience to that and then another uh, few weeks later with about 60 people. Uh, yes. Oh, okay. That's more than five minutes. Okay. I'm not very good at Okay. So anyway, uh, this is one of our posters. Uh, it's trying to stop uh, the war in Korea once and for all. So thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. I hate to tell people to stop talking. There's so many important things to talk about, um, but we have other people would like to, that we have on the agenda. So, um, Al, 
Uh, Al is uh, the chapter leader in Florida, uh, our most active chapter, and he's going to give us a rundown on what's working uh, at their level. Hi, and thank you. I, um, I come from the uh, country of Florida. And um, by the way, I am in awe of all of you folks who come from all over the world and folks who have devoted your lives to the cause of peace. You, you amaze me, and I'm impressed. Um, I live in a place that ha is the world's largest retirement community. It's, the, it's active, active adults, 55 and over. We're 130,000 people, and we're growing by 5,000 people uh, every year. We, for the last four out of the last five years, we've been the fastest growing metropolitan statistical area in the United States. The county I live in has the oldest average age of any county uh, in the United States. By the way, it's really good to see young people here. <laughs> young people, thank you. Um, <laughs> And uh, the community I live in is called the Villages, Florida. It also is the, has the second highest concentration of military veterans in the United States. So uh, we have a whole lot of people in my community who support any and every war the United States has ever started, and, we, and they support any military action that the United States uh, has taken. So that's the setting where we created our local chapter of World Beyond War. Uh, but we also have a lot of people who grew up in the 60s, a lot of people who are Vietnam veterans who have seen the horror and the insanity of war. So we're talking to them and we're getting those folks to come to our meetings. Um, at one of our meetings, we had a person who during the 60s was a member of the Students for Democratic Society. Now, now lives in a, now lives in a golf course community. Uh, we have another person who uh, was at what he said was the first uh, Vietnam protest against the Vietnam War, at least in Manhattan, New York, in 1962. So we have folks like that, and we're getting to know all of them. Our focus is on education and some action. Our biggest challenge is getting um, a bunch of old people to uh, skip golf and tennis and pickleball and swimming pools and come to our meetings and learn something. So thank you. Thank you so much, Al. And uh, now we'd like to call forward uh, Liz Remerswall, pretty close, okay. <laughs> uh, Liz is uh, not only a country coordinator for uh, New Zealand, but she's also a member of the uh, uh, Coordinating Committee of World Beyond War. Liz? Kia ora, thank you, Lee. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa, nā mihi dui, kia koutou and greetings from um, the people of the land, Ngāti Kāngunu, where I come from, by the Tukituki River, Tamata Peak, and greetings to the First Nation people of this land. Thank you for allowing us to be here. <laughs> and, um, yeah, it's a, it's a long... I've come a, a really, really long way and burned a lot of carbon, which I feel terrible about. Um, because war and environment is very much connected. But um, I'm on the International Coordinating Committee, thanks to Leah inviting me when I was at the Wilf Congress last year. And I've just volunteered for the fundraising subcommittee this morning, and uh, um, as well as being the, a new New Zealand coordinator. Um, I'm the daughter of a soldier and the granddaughter of, of two soldiers. Um, for over a hundred and something years, we in New Zealand have been going overseas fighting other people's wars in South Africa, Gallipoli in Turkey, the Somme in France, in Egypt and in, and in Italy. And, and we're still doing it. We still have troops in Afghanistan who are sadly guilty of um, hurting civilians these days. But when I went back to Italy um, a couple of years ago, because my dad always wanted me to go back, to this village where he was during the war. 
and uh, he was in the counterintelligence and he helped these people. They was, they was after the Germans had retreated. And I met two 90-year-olds who remembered my dad by name and they wept when they saw me. But the young soldiers of these days, when they go back to Afghanistan, how will they be greeted? Um, it's the 125th anniversary of New Zealand women voting. First country in the world. Um, uh, we have been nuclear free for 31 years. Um, I'm with my colleague, uh, Laurie Ross, who's been involved in that can You can hear more about that. And also another um, colleague, Alan Weir from New Zealand. He works his life on this as well. Um, and of course, we have the mo world's most beautiful and young um, prime minister. She's 37 year old. Jacinda Ardern, she has a two-month-old baby. She's coming to New York next week where we're, we're going to see her in the United Nations. And uh, However, we still have a long way away to go because our Minister of Defence, it's a coalition party that we have. Our Minister of Defence um, is an ex-army guy and he's also an ex-mercenary for the, um, the Sultan of Oman. So we've got a long way to go. And we're very close um, with our military alliances, um, with, the, with the Five Eyes, um, Projects, you know, the, the militarization of the world is, they've done a great job of it, haven't they? <laughs> um, I've been a member of, of WILF and went to the Congress in The Hague, as some of you have. Um, uh, I'm a journalist, a mother, an environmental campaigner, and a former politician. Um, I'm in awe of Code Pink. I'm going down to Washington, D.C. to stay with Pucky at Code Pink House and do some, we're doing some rallies outside the White House, which is going to be really fun. Um, <laughs> I'm involved with the Hit and Run Inquiry campaign, or World Beyond Warers, which is um, a campaign um, to get accountability for uh, some of the atrocities in Afghanistan. We're civilians, and there's also a legal case uh, that we're working, that we're supporting, uh, where some Afghan civilians have asked for um, taking the government to court for, 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 for hurting, wanting, they want accountability and recompense. Uh, so that's one of the campaigns. Um, we've also got a petition that we're doing in conjunction with Action Station on reducing military spending and asking our government not to spend $2.3 billion on um, buying four um, Poseidon planes which are capable of killing submarines because actually New Zealand has no enemies. We're not at threat. We're not at, we're not at risk. We actually don't need a huge um, defensive thing going on. Um, so that's happening. We've also involved with the Weapons Expo in conjunction with other peace groups uh, we have, where we have nonviolent direct actions um, of this, you know, the weapons fair. And there's also forums, films, creativity and interfaith things going on. Um, and uh, we work with the Australian Peace Network, uh, I've been to Alice Springs and with everybody. So I'm also a Quaker. So just finally, um, I've just finished with a song with my colleague Laurie. And this is, um, the words of this song are, um, the love that we have it does not belong to us alone. It is a gift handed down from our ancestors onto the next generation. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, everybody. Now we're going to have some music. You had a taste of it earlier. Tom Nielsen and Lynn Waldron. We are very lucky to have them here from Massachusetts. Uh, Tom has received over two dozen awards, including two Song of the Year awards from independent musicians. A few years ago, he was nominated for the UN Nelson Mandela Award for Lifetime Achievement in Peace and Justice. Lynn, uh, his activist work has included working with the Sugar Shack Alliance to prevent new fossil fuel infrastructure in New England. They have a long list of awards. You can read the full bios in the program. Tom Nielsen and Lynn Waldron.
Twas in the year eighteen and five, a Highland lass was she. Her daddy was a farmer growing rye and herding sheep. Twas early in the morning when the soldiers come for him and took him off to fight against the French Napoleon. She cut the wood, she pitched the roof, the rain was coming down. When Willie showed upon her step, and not a day too soon, he turned the soul, he sheared the sheep, she spun it on a loom. She kissed the sweat upon his brow, and she showed him to her room. Now Willie was an army man deserting from the war. The taste to steal, the smell of shot, not wanting any more. And oh, how we loved her, and work her art was he. The field stone that he cleared could have built a church or three. Their two-year-old in her embrace and Annie in his arms Snuggled on a frosty morn when Duggar barked alarm Her riders in their coats a red recruiting for the crown Tore her willy from her side and took him off to town Her daddy long had disappeared, now Willie too was gone when at her door twas I appeared, my face all sunk and drawn. I worked the fields like Willie, and I fathered to her John. And she took me to her room at night, when the day was done. Like Willie, I was on the run, leaving war behind. The killing and the slaughter, oh, it wasn't for my kind. Four years hence, our Nelly, to the house come running. Saying that a stranger from the lock side was a coming. Twas if she'd never lost him, and to his arms she flew. But now she had two men she loved, and both of them were true. With me she had a daughter, with Willie bore a son. And both of us before her were in love with Annie Dunn. Now some folk may be saying that we're living deep in sin. But greater sin to fight a war that takes away the man And leaves the families behind surviving as we can We'll make it clear to all who hear We'll not fight your war again Let us bring up Lynn Waldron That was a story I heard when we were touring in Scotland many years ago. And so Jacob said, Daddy, you should write a song about that. Why, he most certainly is. He is. Have you heard about Bill's house? Silver story from the American Civil War. Hey, let's. Right, let's, let's talk about that later because we're crunched for time right now. But thank you. So. December 1st, 1969, what happened on that day? Very important day for a lot of people in this room, maybe. It was the first lottery for the draft in the United States. And my best friend, Jeffrey, pulled the number four. And I had decided that I had more in common with Vietnamese farmers than I did with the Wall Street brokers who wanted to pay me to go kill them, so I left the country. And the last time I saw Jeffrey, he was on his way to Whitehall Street for his induction physical, and I was on my way to South America. 25 years later, we hooked up, and he told me the story of his induction physical. It was back in 1970, after that first lottery, when Jeffrey pulled the number four. 
He went down to his induction, not doing his malfunction when the doctor started to explore. He had him cough, stick out his tongue, say, ah, took his pressure pulse, then the doctor saw. When he went to Jeffrey's scrotum to see how he did totem, he discovered that he only had one ball. Excuse me, this is a serious song. You see, at birth one testicle was upended. So only one of them descended. crypto is what you call it. And it's important to the army how you haul it. Flat feet and venereal infection. Esophagitis, all reasons for rejection. But Jeffrey's only flaw from his toenails to his jaw was a missing testicle upon inspection. Oh, One more ball for the army protocol. His testicular action was only a fraction. If you're gonna do some killing, Two gonads must be chillin'. When to duty calls, you gotta have the balls. Now you can be all you can be if a technicality under examination doesn't get detected. Cause if your anatomy has peculiarity, it's probably gonna leave you deselected. GI function abnormality, schizophrenic psychiatric history. And in your underwear, you gotta have a pair to be in army uniformity. Oh, we needed one more ball. Army protocol for the army protocol. Testicular action. His testicular action. Only a fraction. Was only a fraction. Gonna do some killing. If you're gonna do some killing. Two gonads. Two gonads must be chilling. Two duty. When two duty calls. You gotta have the balls. The doctor said he could sign a waiver. Jeff said, Doc, don't do me any favor. You can all abide my, my tools. tools. Cause there's a reason the army has these rules. I'll take that for a classification. Two balls you need to go war in for the nation. Yeah, he didn't have the package hanging in his sackage. He could have served his country, but he needed one more nut. Oh.
for the Army Protocol. Testicular action is testicular action. Only a fraction was only a fraction. Gonna do some killing if you're gonna do some killing. Two gonads, two gonads must be chillin'. To a duty. When to a duty calls, you gotta have the balls. When to a duty calls, you gotta have the balls. Well, thank you. It's a true story. Remember, the, the rule was back then any missing body part was grounds for uh, deferment, rejection. And, and so that's why guys were cutting off the end digit on their pinky toe. And so many guys were doing it, then they changed it to two, two missing, missing body, body parts. parts. And, uh, so, well, there's no draft anymore. There's no draft. There's no draft. There's, maybe there should be. So I left the country, went to South America. That was 1970. In 75 and 6, I was in Nicaragua working, helping as a translator with the Sandinistas during the revolution. And I came upon a book of poems by Claudia Alegria, a poet from El Salvador. And she had this epic poem, a four page poem about the woman of Sumpu River, uh, La Mujer del Rio Sumpu, about the massacre at Sumpu River. And I took just a small translation of that for this song. Come with me, let us climb the volcano, break through the fog, history is bubbling there. Mona Sani Marti and all you brave people. Gambling with death or our freedom. We tried to get away, it was the 14th of May. My man taken away with his thumbs tied. I wept for him in my silence. My youngest son in my arms. When the soldiers came, I played dead. Afraid my baby would cry. I was hiding in the river for a long time. My wet body is the earth, wounded mother earth. Oozing tenderness from a gaping wound. The soldiers do not see me, or the gringo who counts the dead nor the Yankee pilot in his gunship overhead. They cannot see the Gadiados disguised as ancient sentinels. With the woman of Sumpu, let us climb the volcano. Break through the fog. History is bubbling there. Morasani Marti and all you brave people. Gambling with death for our freedom. That's, that's how much left? Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's do it. And then I'll do the eight of cows.
There's a drone in the air in Pakistan. Hey, military is on Columbia plan. From Sam Sarah, we was hanging from a crane. Shell and ship running Ogoni domain. From a man you will can bully junior senators to vote for war in Afghanistan. And get some belt and can rattle their sabers. For making combat with Iran, oh, you can feel how you will every time you see old glory unfurled. But these colors don't run. These colors don't run. These colors don't run the world. You can build a wall. Obama said we lost South America, but I can still find it on a map. He says we need those mercenaries in Syria and Iraq. You can block in the people in Cuba. You can block an information flow. You can't bomb Vietnam to the Stone Age and torture in Guantanamo. And you can feel how you will every time you see old glory unfurled. But these colors don't run. These colors don't run. These colors don't run the world. You can build a wall on the border with Mexico. Build another in Palestine. Build a wall in the minds of our people while the truth you undermine. You can love your country or leave it. You can wave the red, the white, and blue. You can get child labor at Walmart when you wear those Nike shoes. You can feel how you will every time you see old glory unfurled, but these colors don't run. These colors don't run. These colors don't run the world. Contras kill civilian populations, destroy their clinics and their schools, their cropland and water systems, to eat a fight who Samoa to decide which Samosa rules. You can say they hate our freedoms, but look at the damage that we've done to get every precious metal and fossil fuel and their labor under our thumb. You can feel how you will every time you see old glory unfurled. But these colors don't run. These colors don't run. These colors don't run the world. Yeah, these colors don't run. These colors don't run. These colors don't, don't run the world. Thank you. Well, have people here heard about the documentary The Wanted 18? Well, is very good. I recommend that you find it. It's on Netflix. Um, in 1987, for the first Intifada, it was against the law for Palestinians to have their own dairy. They had to get all their milk from Israel. So the people in Beit Sahur, which is part of the Greater Bethlehem, I can't talk in tune because it picks up my... Ooh, there it is. 
this. People of Beit Sahur bought 18 Holsteins from a farmer in Kibbutz Hillel, from an Israeli farmer in Kibbutz Hillel. And they started their own dairy, which was against the law. Because it's not allowed, because they're Palestinian. Let's see. Now we was back in 1988 with the occupation of the Palestine state. When Beit Sahur bought 18 cows, but it wasn't what the law allows. If you want to drink milk, the law of the state says you get it from Israel, not a farm you create. So 18 cows went underground and for the next four years. They couldn't be found. Well, word come out from the high command. There's 18 cows in the promised land. They're solid and spotted, white and black. So it's time to plan a sneak attack. So 18 cows all had to hide because the army's coming from the other side. They came by land and choppers in the air. But they couldn't find those cows anywhere it's against the law for milk to be made by 18 cows in the bovine brigade 18 cows committing the crime of making milk in palestine now 18 cows give you milk to drink but that ain't all it's more than you think it's independence and dignity and a threat to Israel's security. Cause they might make butter and they might make cheese and other intifada other activities so they stay undercover and do as they please. Thinking of cow conspiracies. It's against the law for milk to be made by 18 cows in the bovine brigade. 18 cows committing the crime, making milk in Palestine. Well, hiding neath the fig and vine, 18 cows want it dead or alive. These lactating ladies committing the crime, making milk and babies in Palestine. There was Lola and Goldie Ribka and Ruth. I can't make this stuff up. It's really the truth. And all the others. There were 14 more in a Milky Way in the middle of a war. It's against the law for milk to be made by 18 cows in the Brooklyn Brigade. 18 cows committing the crime, making milk in Palestine. Two more? All right. We got two more, so come on up. Oh, I can't tell you that. Ken, you got to go watch the movie. The Wanted 18. So let's do the recycle song. So now, all right, I've said some unkindly things about the military, but we need to give them credit when they do something right. Okay. And I don't know about if you know about their recycling program. And if something doesn't work, they recycle it. And this is what they did with 20 planes in Afghanistan and there was there was a, a veteran uh, I was doing this one gig and this uh, this veteran could not believe that his country would do something like this and he actually was looking it up during the show and he realized it was true and it changed how he felt about the US military and its government I, I just this one song 500 million dollars 
You paid for 20 planes for the Afghan Air Force in 2008 to support the Cabo Rain. They were transport planes, G-222s, but none of them seemed to fly. Too many performance and maintenance problems to keep them up in the sky. So they sat on the tarmac in Cabo, 20 planes just hanging around. So the U.S. Army destroyed them and sold the scrap metal at six cents a pound. Six cents a pound, six cents a pound for G-222s just hanging around. But could we have bought with 500 million in hand instead of buying scrap metal for Afghanistan? But war is good business. Oh, it's a win when you see for the weapons and gas and the oil industry. We can only have weapons. Oh, if you foot the bill, we can only have a war if you vote to kill. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not one to complain. I'd rather scrap metal than a war aeroplane. But I'd rather scrap metal. Yeah, build me a bridge or a school or a home where someone could live. Six cents a pound, six cents a pound for G222s just hanging around. What could we have bought with 500 million in hand instead of buying scrap metal for Afghanistan? Now here at home, yeah, we got a lemon law. You get your money back if you find a flaw. Hey, war industry has got to stand behind what it made. Cause it's six cents a pound, that's a lot of lemonade. Six cents a pound, six cents a pound. For G222s just hanging around, what could be a bot? With 500 million in hand, instead of buying scrap metal for Afghanistan. When you buy an airplane, oh, you gotta get a guarantee that it'll fly in the air and not fall on me. But when all is said and done, oh, you know it's right by me. At six cents a pound, scrap the military. Six cents a pound, six cents a pound For G222s just hanging around What could we have bought With 500 million in hand Instead of buying scrap metal for Afghanistan Alright, so we got one more One more, is that it? Alright, thank you very much!